This episode of the Western Outdoor News Podcast is brought to you by Western Outdoor News Charters. For a full list on upcoming charters, visit wonews.com. Our next upcoming charter is going to be a Triton Gale Force combo trip July 21st, leaving out of the L.A. waterfront sport fishing. We turned around and, boy, if all the mullet didn't just fly out in the air at once right in front of us. Hey folks, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Western Outdoor News Podcast. This week we talk with Cabo Surf caster Wesley Bruff. Wesley and his client were fishing for roosters when one last cast ended with a huge white snook from the surf. Now a pending world record waiting for confirmation from the IGFA. It was on the the backside of a swell that was coming in, so I, I saw the splash, but I didn't see the fish. We then sit in with Gonzo Ortiz, the winner of the Western Outdoor News San Diego Offshore Jackpot things I know about when Marcus or Adam are usually driving the boat, it's either go big or go home. Gonzo and I talk about the technique and gear he used to land that large bluefin. Well, without further ado, folks, let's just get right into it with Cabo Surfcaster, Wesley Bruff. I guess before we start really getting into the, you know, the catch, let's kind of talk about, you know, what you do down there in Cabo and, and your little surf cast expeditions you, you run. Yeah, no, no, actually it started years ago. I think uh, I get asked quite a bit, like, oh, how long have you been doing this now? And I'm like, counting up from when I started, this will be a, this will be 16 years of guiding now. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of blown up over the years. A lot of people are getting into surf fishing now, but um, I started out young. I used to just go out and fish on my own every morning and evening. And um, I had one of the one of the tackle shop owners down here was, kept trying to get me to guide. He goes, "Oh, you should do it. You should take people out." And, and I'm like, "Nah, I don't. I don't think I, I don't think that's for me. You know, I don't. I don't want to take you. I just want to do it for fun for myself. You know." Yeah, that's that's a big jump. Yeah, after a couple of years, it was like, it was like had people take me out. You know, take me to go catch a rooster fish. And I'm like, all right. So I bought a couple setups and started doing it. And it was kind of a, a laid back thing at first. You know, I would take you know one one person out a week or two people out a week and fish every other day for myself. And then, you know, then life, life got a little more, I started growing up and having to face life a little bit more, I guess. And then I ended up getting married and um, then it was like, Oh, well, if I want to keep doing this, I have to actually make it a business. (laughs) And sure enough. Yeah. Now, now it's a, that's full on. I, I got six days a week and, um, sometimes evenings as well as mornings, uh, but try and try and stick to the mornings. Yeah. So you're pretty busy and it's a year round fishery for the most part there. Yeah. For the most part, it does slow down some, I would say, um, you know, end of, end of August, September, part of October, the, the weather gets really hot. The water, the water temperature gets really hot too. It gets up into the, the low or mid nineties, uh, the water temperature and, fish tend to not like it that hot. So stuff moves out to deeper water and the bite dies off. Yeah. And you grew up in Cabo. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Actually my, my parents moved here before I was born. So that was, <laughs> so you're, up. you're a native and, and you're actually now, you know, running a business and guiding down there. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a, definitely blessed to be, be able to do something I love and, and make it a decent living at it. And, and keep it going. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just kind of, you know, slide right into this, uh, big snook catch. Uh, you were with a client that, that evening. I was, we actually, um, we were scheduled to go out and we had this, uh, we had this hurricane last week that came and kind of buzzed the, the coast of us down. It ended up veering out to the East a little bit, but we still got, um, some surf from it, some big waves. And then, uh, we had a really strong north wind coming from it. I don't know why why it was a north wind, but um, all those conditions kind of led up to, to that day. And it was the only only time we had open to go. And I was like, well, man, let's let's go for it. The water temperature is right, even though the the weather is really crap. You know, the, the wind was blowing probably 25 or 30 miles an hour. And the waves were, they looked like storm waves. They were stacked four or five waves deep, you could see them coming and um, just a, a real fast period between them. And we get out to the beach and we're just, we're looking at each other and 
like, man, what are we doing here? This looks are we crazy. You know, who's we we're getting sandblasted. The the sand was blowing on the on the beach so hard, our legs were getting sandblasted. Uh, so we, we kind of we thought we were crazy there for a little bit, and all of a sudden we see all the mullet jump out of the water, and we start casting. And um, a little bit into it, we I ended up hooking on a nice rooster fish, big big one. He's uh, passed it off, and and uh, Matt is the the buddy who was with me, and he he fought it in. We got some awesome pictures. He was he was dying to get a rooster, and ended up being able to get that one up on the beach first. And he was about, I'd say 50, 55 pounds or so. Wow. That's a good, that's and a good fish. Yeah, no, it was a beautiful fish. He, he came up all colors, all lit up. The fin was super, super lit up as well. And we, we got a couple of pictures quick and got him back in the water and he, he took off, actually he took off really strong, took off upright, made it under, under some of those waves, which is kind of, kind of a big deal when you're trying to release them getting them back past the surf yeah because um, you need to get out far enough to give them a chance yeah usually <laughs> i mean when it's not storm conditions and the water is you know decently warm uh i'll jump in with them and i actually swim them out duck them under some of the first shore break there and get them out past the waves so they they have a chance to recover beyond the break yeah yeah, and totally. uh, it was just the current was too strong. It was that storm, storm surf, and I got in up to my waist and could feel it pulling sideways. And I'm like, nah, this isn't even smart. So I held him there for a second, took a couple waves, and then sent him out. And sure enough, I we saw his fin come up past the set of waves out there, and he was kicking. So <laughs> that was that was super cool. We were we were stoked right there and then, and um, and then it was like, wow, all right, let's keep fishing, you know. And so we started throwing again. And literally only three casts later, I hooked into another one. And, and these are all, another, are you guys fishing the stick baits at this point? Yeah, we were fishing the, it was uh, actually a uh, Savage Gear Max stick. Uh, but we'd been, we'd been throwing, you know, a few different stick baits and um, some stuff just worked better in the wind. And because it was such intense conditions, um, I was throwing with my heavy rod that I usually use around the rocks for big snapper and, and stuff like that, throwing really heavy stick baits and it's a stiffer rod and it's a, the reel is a, one of the Daiwa, the Saltiga 20,000. Okay. So and big, big spinner. I, yeah. Big spinning, spinning. Rail. How and long are these, how long are these rods you're fishing with? Uh, 12 foot, uh, 12 foot surf rods. Wow. Um, so the, you're able to send a big, heavy stick bait out beyond the surf. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, no, they're there's some nice rods. They're, they're made in England. They're uh, century century rods, and um, yeah, they, they'll throw. I mean, up to up to eight ounce stuff. And uh, we were throwing. I think the the stick bait I was using is about six ounces or so. And so it was it was firing out there pretty good. And but I was uh, throwing heavy line. You know, I had uh, my rock line on there, which was hundred pound braid. And yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> typically not, a, not what I would fish over the sand beach. Um, but my other setup has 30 pound braid on it. And just in those conditions, I knew if we hooked a 50, 60 pound fish with the 30 pound braid with that much wind and current, we'd be, we'd be there all afternoon. And then the fish would come in way too tired and end up dying. Um, so anyways, we landed the second rooster and took all the pictures and we're just like, you know, what an epic evening. And Matt started throwing again. He, he caught a Jack Crevel on his, on his lure. He got a, it was probably 25 pound Jack and tossed that guy back. And then, um, by that time it was starting to get dark. It was, you know, sun had gone down and it was, it was starting to, we were casting and having trouble seeing our lure land out there. So it was, it was fairly dark at that point. And so we hung, hung up the lures on the rods and said, well, you know, epic evening, you know, I think we'll call it a, we'll call it a night, man. That was, you know, nothing better than that. We got all of our pictures, everything got released good. And we turned around and boy, if all the mullet didn't just fly out in the air at once right in front of us. <laughs> and it was just like, we dropped everything and ran back down and casted. And yeah, I, 
got hooked up. I saw the big splash in the dark out there. It was kind of at the edge of the cast and it was on the, the backside of a swell that was coming in. So I, I saw the splash, but I didn't see the fish. Yeah. And so it tar- started taking line hard and, and I thought, well, I, I told Matt, I was like, man, I, I think I got another one. You want to fight him? And he goes, no, man, I don't, I don't want anything. I, I just fought two of those things and a Jack, my arm's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, no, you take it. And I, All right. Well, it's too dark to get a good picture of, of a rooster. So, and I'm just going to, I'm going to crank down and horse him in so that uh, we can just let him go and get out of here because we're not even going to get a good picture of him. And so I <laughs> just took the reel and cranked down the drag. I'm like not giving him any line and started walking backwards on the beach and pumping on it really hard. And I probably, I, it tried to run really hard and I, I just Didn't wasn't giving him any, any line. And it probably took all of six minutes before I had this thing on the beach. I mean, <laughs> and slid him up in the dark with one of the waves and I see him flopping on the beach and it was definitely not a rooster. I'm like, Whoa, what the heck is that? So I run down and I look and it's this massive snook. And I was like, I started yelling. Matt, Matt was just, I don't know, maybe 30 yards down the beach from me. I'm like, dude, get over here. Look at this thing. Dang. You know, he, drag it up on the beach and he's shaking everywhere and you know the stick bait down i mean he just he, they got that huge bucket mouth he just engulfed the whole thing jeez and i couldn't i couldn't imagine a snook that size that's just that's insane yeah it was so he was so fat i mean i've I caught big snook before but this one was unlike any other one i mean just abnormally fat and i mean by the time we ended up getting him um getting him back he he wasn't going to make it anyways by how far he got that stick bait down and the way he was thrashing around. And, you know, it was just not, not a possibility to get him released. And so we, we were like, well, you know, I'm pretty sure, I mean, there's two kinds of snook down here. I know there's the the black and the white snook. Um, and I know the the record for the black snook is, is a pretty lofty record. I think it's, it's 59, 59 something. And so I was like, well, I don't know if we're going to hit that record, but I'm like, if it's a white, you know, the, I know the record for the white is 47, it was 47, eight, I believe. And I'm like, well, I don't know. This thing looks pretty, pretty darn big. And I go, well, if usually when we go on vacation, I curl suitcases with one arm to check if they're, you know, over the 50 pound <laughs> limit, you know, I can just barely get 50 pounds on a curl. And so I, I grabbed this guy and tried to curl him and I got him like part way up and there was no way I was curling him. I'm like, dude, I think I'm pretty darn sure this thing's over 50 pounds. And so I'm like, all right, well, we got to, we got to figure out how to, how to keep this guy and weigh him officially and all that. So anyways, we, we got, uh, got the pictures we could in the dark, which was really difficult. I was, I had, I was telling you earlier, we, we stuck, uh, stuck both of our cell phones in the sand with the flashlights on facing me <laughs> and uh, took the camera and, and turned the, turned the shutter speed way down on the camera, trying to get a, a decent picture in the dark. And, you know, out of 30, 40 pictures that we got, there was probably three or four that were semi clear and that we could work with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, that was, that was our, our catch, our evening, it ended up measuring, um, ended up weighing 51.3 pounds, um, on the official scale. And, and that we had to weigh him the next morning actually. So he went in an ice chest in ice overnight. So, you know, they say they lose weight over time. I don't know. I don't know how much or how much he ended up losing, but, um, yeah, the next, next morning we got him in to, to get him weighed and he was 51.3 and 50 inches 50 inches long and the the girth on him he was pretty much 30 inches around 29 29 and a half um yeah and i'm like oh man that's a size that's a size shorts i wear man he's as big around <laughs> as me dang <laughs> that's that is crazy so yeah. um when you, you guys really don't target the snook you were saying earlier right you just kind no, of incidental fact, when you do uh, catch him yeah, it's pretty, 
And they, they get them in some areas a little bit more than others down here around the mouths of some estuaries and um yeah because those not, fish do actually they they go up into the brackish water and stuff don't yeah they? they can take the they can take the brackish fresh water yeah yeah and that's uh, awesome but typically how they fish them around those estuaries is with live bait yeah uh, because it's it's that real murky water the the milky look and has all the silt in it it's mm -hmm. not real great for lure fishing uh, yeah and so yeah I don't, I don't target them i like i like lure fishing i'm not not really a bait guy tends to be kind of boring unless you're really the baits flying all over the place and you're just hooking up a live bait throwing it in getting hooked up yeah but, yeah um, totally i, I don't, totally I don't get just that. like sitting around <laughs> i'd rather i'd rather cast and walk and cast and walk and so that was you know i i don't get them too often we're usually fishing for something else and it's an incidental catch just as this one was mm -hmm. and very good surprise i mean it the roosters were kind of our like goal that day and it was like the the epic catch and then they really got overshadowed by by this guy at the end of the night <laughs> so when when you go out on these trips are you guys you guys are having because you're getting off the beaten path a little i'm i'm assuming are you guys four-wheel driving to some of these spots and, and and getting out out off the beaten path yeah some some of the spots are are four-wheel spots um this was up the pacific not too far we literally just uh pulled up to the beach it wasn't not a super remote beach or anything it just uh really random i mean <laughs> not not a beach <laughs> i would ever target snook at for sure yeah there was no no uh fresh water coming in no there's not even a riverbed you know there's it's not even a, yeah you you caught him in between two of them huh <laughs> yeah no it was it was not not a spot i would be targeting snook for for sure if if you told me i needed to go out and get a get a snook in the next week I would be fishing almost everywhere, but there. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's crazy how that works out, man. That is awesome. Uh, yeah. And en ended up uh, <clears throat> differentiating. It was a, um, it's a Pacific white snook. The, we get, the, so the it white is. So that's black. where the, okay. So that's where that record is pending. It's, it is the yes, Pacific exactly. white snook. And I went, uh, about two sleepless days before getting confirmation from the IGFA ichthyologist that it was a in fact a, a white snook now are they doing this just by looks how how easy is it or how hard is it to differentiate the two apparently there's um it's the the telling factor is in the dorsal spines um okay there's a there's a, a length thing going on between the um it's like the, between it's spines second and third the second and third dorsal spine so on the the black snook the, the second and third are longer than the first. And okay. in the, the white snook, it, it's basically, it tapers from the first being the, the tallest one in front. And then it just tapers down from there. Each one is shorter from there. And the two last ones are, are really short. Okay. And, and so it's kind of, that's a telltale factor. There's a lot of like other things that are a little bit more subjective, like the, the shape of the, the snout and the color of, um, the tips of some of the, the pectoral fins and they, they have a, a few other, a few other identifying factors, um, that, that give them, give them away. But, uh, the main thing is that, that dorsal fin, if you go, and I, I did a bunch of research and, and it was pretty obvious through the research. I was 95% sure, uh, yeah. just by looking at, you know, verified pictures of each one, you could tell, you could really tell the difference between the two. So I took a, a ton of pictures of, of the fins afterwards and sent them into IGFA and um, yeah, it took them just a, a day to get back to me, but it was like, Oh man, I'm sitting there going, wow, what if it's a black snook and you don't get the record, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, they, they got back and they, between two of them, they said, no, we went over all the, all the pictures and the, the data and it looks, it's yeah, pretty much a hundred percent sure it's, it's a white snook and not a black. So, so, uh, you guys are targeting right now. Are you guys mostly targeting the roosters or are you guys targeting any of the snapper and things uh, around the Rocky reefs? There are some snapper around still. Uh, the best part of the, the snapper bite was kind of mid May through the beginning of June. So but, spring. Um, one of the guys on the beach next to us this morning got a got a really nice snapper. It was it was probably twenty five pounds or so, a good Kubera snapper. Yeah. Do you guys get the um the Bard Pargo ever? 
Uh, we do occasionally. They um, they're not always aggressive lure hitters. They they will sometimes. Um, yeah, we uh, we fish for that stuff up you know up north and where we're at, and it's one that we have yet to figure out. Yeah, without, they, without trying to use, we don't use bait either. But okay, I was gonna say they hit bait really well in the evening at night. That's what everyone's told me is you gotta yeah. you gotta chum them up at night and fish bait. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, um, and they, um, we just don't have that in big us. Ones down here. <laughs> We've caught a few on lures though. We we do we have gotten a few on on diving type lures like a uh, Rapala type stuff, uh, the X wraps or um, around the rocks. Yeah, we've gotten a couple of them. Very cool. So, uh, Wesley, if anyone needed to get a hold of you and, and wanted to fish with you this, uh, this season while they're down there, what's the best way to get a hold of you and do that? Um, go oh, to your best. website or, uh, yeah, through the website, there's a, there's a contact page on the website, cobblesurfcaster.com or, um, the best way is through, through email. I get, you know, right now it's, I know social media is kind of the big thing, you know, Instagram and Facebook, sending people messages and it's great to chat and stuff, but it just makes booking business stuff super difficult and i actually have on my instagram and it seems like nobody reads it <laughs> <laughs> but i have it on my bio i'm like i do not book trips through the direct messages here and the biggest reason is because every time you post a story on instagram and someone replies to it it falls in your message category and just buries any legit messages in a yeah in 500 story responses yeah. So then I end up losing people, missing people, and, and people get mad that I don't get back to them. But email is the best way, cobblesurfcaster at yahoo.com or through the website contact page. Um, and whenever I'm checking my email, I'm at my calendar doing the booking. So it is the most effective way to get a hold of me. <laughs> oh, that's that's some good info there that I'm sure a lot of people would, would like to have. Because uh, obviously <laughs> getting getting a trip book is tough and and if if you're doing it that way and your your information is getting buried <laughs> yeah no it's just you know email it goes in one it goes in one stack you can get back to people and you can have a record of the conversation it makes it really easy to keep people organized and you know when you get 15 or 20 emails a day about trips and you're trying to keep stuff straightened out then yeah, Instagram, you digging through messages on Instagram, trying to hunt people down that you know had just sent you a message just makes it really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, Wesley, it was great talking to you, and hopefully we get to hear from you soon on uh, whether or not that pending world rec record Pacific White Snook gets confirmed by the IGFA. It sounds like sounds like you got it but you know you never know until yeah you never know i mean <laughs> yeah we did do we did do everything by the book and we got it into uh minerva's baja tackle and they she has the the main uh certified scale. certified scale for for the igfa there it's a digital scale and she happens to be the their official waymaster here in cabo okay uh, so we got it into her and she signed off on all the paperwork on the, the application we filled all that out and we took video of the whole um, taking it in and weighing process, and we got all the pictures. So, I mean, it was we we did it did it by the book, and so you know, hopefully, hopefully everything pans out. And now that we have confirmation that it is the species that we're after, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Wesley. And like I said, we'll uh, we'll be talking and hearing from you here pretty soon. Oh, awesome, Daniel. Now looking forward to it. All right, thank you. All right, take care. If you guys haven't already, check out the Big Fish Challenge. This Western Outdoor News Tournament is 10 weeks long, fishing for bonito, barracuda, yellowtail, halibut, tuna, lingcod, and white sea bass. Everyone has a chance to win the Big Fish Challenge. Whether you're on a sport boat, kayak, private boat, or even fishing from shore, you're able to enter to win the Big Fish Challenge. For more information, check out wonews.com. All right, folks, and we're going to jump right in with this year's winner of the San Diego Offshore Jackpot, Gonzo Ortiz. Yeah, uh, this is this would be my fifth year now. Um, first time I jumped on the boat, was, of course, was when Marcus was running it. And um, one of my good friends was on the trip at the time. He was placing third in the whole tournament, but got bumped from that. Uh, the following year... Uh, our buddy, uh, Lucky Johnny, uh, got the biggest fish overall and won it for the new low end that year. 
Um, following up to the next year, um, we didn't get tickets in time. Ended up being on Old Glory, but lo and behold, our boat won that year. <laughs> so we've been going around with a little thing calling me and Lucky Johnny the, the good luck charms on the boats. So following the next year, we had uh, Brendan Thomas on our boat, who was on the New Lowen also, but he placed third in the tournament. And then, uh, of course, we had the coronavirus hit that got pushed away. And then this year I jumped on the new low end again, actually getting the last three spots um, and then ended up purchasing one more uh, waiting list spot for the new low end. So we had four good buddies of us that normally we group together, Shane Thomas, myself, Sylvester Fuentes and Lucky Johnny. Um, And uh, we normally went with our repetition of working hard, grinding first thing in the morning. it was pretty much fairly, uh, uh, we had one guy at 1.30 in the morning with a crimson red jig on a, a Dio SK jig, bring one. He boated one. It was about a 60 pounder. And then after that, it was uh, my bite. I honestly, mine was uh, kind of weird. Um, I thought I would either f- feel like a stopped jig or at least something pulling on it. Uh, my line shook. It was a really weird shake. I bumped it in low gear and I started whining and whining. Felt like it was like a 40 pounder coming to the boat. And uh, the crew members were just giving me a good heckling time saying, come on, get that thing to the boat. We got bigger fish to get. I probably got about eight or nine wraps of my uh, top shot on. And uh, all of a sudden he just peeled line and he started running. So, um, my buddy started recording it about 6.07, he said, and, and at, toward, towards the end of it, pretty much ended at 6.37. Okay. I hardly did any work. The rod I was fishing was the United Composites Viper Rod, and I hardly did any work. I, all I did was just keep whining on the low gear and... Uh, Use the rail and just, yeah. and just fought the fish. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have that much swell out there, too, so it was kind of a very unique to not try to pump the rod, but I just kept it on the rail and just started going. And next thing you know it, the guys are like, we got deep color. And uh, we were up at the bow when they gaffed the fish. And uh, Adam, uh, Sean, and then I believe another individual named Brett were the ones that gaffed. And as soon as I looked over, first thing Adam said was, she's a big mama. So, yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, uh, was very happy with, uh, the way every, all the line and everything was set up on the rod and the reel. And of course the new land crew has always been my favorite and my bunch of fish. Yeah. Let's, let's, is that your personal best so far? Yes. Or? Yes. My biggest at one time was one, uh, 25 and, uh, that one gave me some work. That one put me <laughs> on the boat at least five times. This one, we just went to the bow once back to stern back to the bow and that was it and then next you know they gaffed her at the front so now it, it was a it was really uh, overwhelming i had been fishing this much past season with a lot of work with the coronavirus too uh, as a matter of fact worked over 2600 hours um just building elevators and escalators so jumping back into the water felt real great <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm sure and how did you uh i guess a big thing is how do you guys prepare for these trips? I mean, you got to have your, you know, your crimps down, right? You're, I'm sure you're, uh, you know, loading up your top shot just a few days before really preparing. Um, what's your setup? What was your setup today? I know you said you had the, the United composites. Yeah. What was your reel and, and line setup? Okay. So t- typically I will take, especially if, uh, I, things I know about when Marcus or Adam are usually driving the boat, it's either go big or go home. One of the, one of the main things they do. So um, I already knew they're not going to go play with the light stuff. So they said, hey, bring just the heavy only. So I had four heavy rod setups. I had uh, two accurate Valiants, a 1,000 and 800, and a Dauntless uh, 600, and then um, one Makaira 30. My buddy let me borrow his ATD 30 because I didn't have enough time initially up to this point where I was going to have uh, something over 130 or 150 uh, pound setup that I wanted and um, popped the reel on my rod was fishing a 130 pound holocore 
with a hundred pound top shot and the leader I had on the Daiwa SK jig I was fishing was uh, 200. It was a 200 crimp on both sides. It was about five and a half feet long. We added extra assist hooks on it too. Stinger, uh, stinger assist hooks. And um, apparently the Zebra Glow in the Dark had been the hot jig. That's the first thing I dropped as soon as they said start dropping. They said they were about 30 fathoms below. Let her rip. And uh, she got bit. So... Of all the of all the fish that were bit on the boat, most of uh, we only had three on jigs, and the rest were all uh, sinker rigs. But I was very glad to have uh, happy to get that bluefin on a jig. It had been a while since I got one on a jig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and it's it's become a uh, this year. It seems that that you know bite in the dark has really uh, made a difference. These guys are fishing these jigs all night long. It seems like if you know fishing grounds are just within 30 40 miles you're fishing by 1 a.m no problem yeah yeah no um the work ethic has changed um pretty much you better have all your rods and reels and jigs on as soon as you get on the boat and go straight to bed uh, as soon as the nun as soon as the captain's given his uh his safety uh speech regarding uh you know uh life vests and in case of emergency and then everybody goes straight to bed because everybody knows they got to be about one, one thirty in the morning to start working. So <laughs> you could tell everybody was pretty exhausted, um, going into it, um, early in the morning, but it was a lot of coffee, a lot of energy drinks, pushing <laughs> everybody to keep working. Cause they're everybody's it's, it's the camaraderie on the boat trip. It's pretty unique. When we do these tuna trips, you don't see a lot of selfish guys. Um, uh, right off the bat, guys were like voluntarily, um, hey, cut my line if it's on. Do, don't do this. Don't do that. Whatever you guys do, there's, you literally almost felt like you had spectators saying, hey, get away from so-and-so. He's hooked right now. Drop it over there. Go drop it over here. And you know what? I wouldn't even bother dropping right now. This fish has got him going around the boat, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome to, you know, during a tournament like that, that the whole boat's working as a team at that point. And, and, you know, trying to make sure that lines are clear from that fish coming down the rail. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it was pretty cool. Um, actually, there was a past, um, I want to say, there was two guys that have placed before that were on the boat. We're, we see each other very common for the past five years. When we see each other, we dead look at each other's eyes. Big old handshake, half a hug. Good to see you. How you been? <laughs> you ready to win this thing? It, it's really great. This tournament, um, I don't, I, it just, it don't matter what boat. It, it, it just, everybody's going to have their personals, but just the camaraderie alone is, is real static. It's pretty cool to see. Um, I enjoy that with anybody I fish with. So just going out there, being on the water, smiling, having a good time. That's pretty much what it's about. So, you know, catching a big fish though, it's a super bonus. I'll give you that, you know? Yeah. Cool. And, and you said that SK jig's been the hot ticket yeah. and, and I've heard the same from multiple anglers and, um, you're fishing that zebra flash yep. and, um, they're, they're hard to come by right now. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> after I got off this trip, I did another overnighter on the Eldo. We ended up going to San Clemente and I caught, uh, two yellowtail and a bunch of, uh, calico and some rockfish. And as soon as I got off that boat trip, I went right on to the tuna wars. And, um, that first morning I lost four Daiwa SK jigs because we had five to six people bit and just we all got shoved into one corner and believe me, the heart was breaking on the jigs. Not so much the fish kind of like kind of need that to fish, you, <laughs> you know, and the zebra flashes were hot for me that morning. And, uh, I would guarantee that for some re unknown reason, that 250 gram was an eye candy, super eye candy for them. So a lot of guys were throwing the three hundreds and the one fifties and not so much, nothing there. It was just that 250 was the sweet spot. So yeah, it must have been matching the hatch of some sort down there. Yeah, I don't, now, are when you guys are getting these fish up, they've probably pretty much evacuated their their stomachs by the time they're up. I know they cough up a lot of stuff. Did you guys notice anything in the well, coughing we, up when you we, land the fish? We did. Uh, a couple of them did have uh, some sardines in them. I noticed uh, mine when they, when they got him up. Uh, he actually had a couple pieces of squid in him, and uh, okay. it was very unique. Um I didn't, you know, how we normally see a nice red crab balloon. You'll see just their guts just spewing, you know, red crab. This was nothing like that. It was, they're hanging around eating on those baits. Um, they're doing different death circles than I've normally seen. 
these guys were doing anywhere from like 30 to 40 foot death circles. And it was weird because a lot of the why, uh, a lot of the whys were being used to maintain, uh, the correction of the line to make sure it doesn't come near the boat at all. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like you guys are probably on a spot, a big one. Yeah, we did. We picked up, <laughs> yeah, we did. And, um, uh, just, it, it was unique, but again, you know, um, I didn't count more than, I don't know, I think I counted to 40 before I got hit. I was just doing a count off when I dropped off mine. I just wanted to, I'm, I'm just counting one with thousand. I'm counting to 10, 1000 repeatedly. And as soon as I got to 40 seconds, that's when the line shook. It was like, like I said, it was nothing I've never felt before, but usually I feel a stopping jig or a nice yank, but that was not the case this time. Yeah. So, <laughs> but Hey, all in all, it was, it was a great, it was a great fight and just, you just for you to be there. I think we have some video. A friend of mine has a video. You just hear the guys just ripping on me. Come on, Gonzo, work that bitch, do this. I'm like, hey man, the guy. I'm being nice right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Even, I'm wearing a sweater. I haven't had my coffee yet, guys. Just relax. <laughs> so. Oh man, that's awesome. And then, um, I mean, obviously you're planning on it next year, right? Oh. And, and we're hoping to get more boats into it because it seems like it just keeps growing and growing, and the demand is there. So yeah, it's uh, you know, I can't I can't wait till next year to see what happens. And I guess another big thing is, have you seen this great of fish over the last, you know, six years doing this, five years doing this? has the grade of fish just gotten bigger and bigger? And obviously the technique's changing. Yes. Yes. The grade of fish technique has changed. I remember years ago, if you jumped on a new land, Marcus was driving you straight down near the Saners and you know, they were asking us to, they would drive out in their little skiff boat, say, Hey, whatever you do, you know, don't flash any lights, fish about this far. Don't get any closer. And we're, you know, you're plucking 30, 40 pound grade fish very unheard of to hear about somebody getting a 60, 80 pounder. And then just everything starts changing. Um, I started seeing more East coast style fishing coming over. Uh, just because, you know, I, uh, I, I talked to uh, Joe and Dave Marciano. Um, and when they would come over for the two wars, they'd talk about their stuff and they would take our stuff and, and take it back East coast, you know? Mm-hmm. So for, for me, and then you could start seeing people use the knife jigs, the flat falls, um, you know, poppers, everything just, you're pretty much throwing everything in the kitchen sink at these guys now to get these bigger grades and, yeah. and it's working, it's working and new techniques are coming. Who would have thought a sinker rig setup would be a new ideal thing. And now they're rubber coated and people are soldering swivels and, and even, <laughs> uh, even assist hooks to them now, just because, uh, it, you know, you, you want to make sure you come up on these short bites, whatever these these bigger grades are doing now, you know? So it, it's pretty cool. I like seeing it all and it, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, uh, I just can't wait to see what next year brings because I'm super excited to get back on the boat, try to go out there, work just as hard and do my thing again with all my friends. Yeah. And your next, your next trips, uh, I think we were talking about earlier coming up in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing a three day, uh, Aztec. Uh, it's a blue or bus trip. We're doing, a lot of kite fishing, so let's see if I can break a personal record there. But it's a United Composite sponsored trip, and uh, it's a limited load too. So three days, I think it's like eighteen guys out there just going fishing. Just uh, yeah, that limited load trip's the way to do it <laughs> if you can get on one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was pretty excited. Uh, me and my little brother are going on it. Uh, he has not fished anything like this before. Um, so it's, it'd be kind of nice to kind of dedicate most of this trip to him to help him get what I'm used to when it comes to these bluefin, um, and, and just share it and just keep going from there, man. Cause I like to, like to see this, uh, fishery just keep going the way it does with a lot of the camaraderie it does and a lot of the unique situations it goes through. So. Yeah, definitely. Well, Gonzo, it was great talking to you and, um, you know, I know we're going to see you next mm-hmm. year. <laughs> mm-hmm, for sure. Um, oh, you know what? Let's talk about this. What did you win? Oh, yeah. Because we didn't even talk about yeah. that. <laughs> what did you win? <laughs> I think I was just saying, it's just the, the bluefin to the mine was the biggest win. Plus, yeah. Uh, let's see. Winning the cash prize of uh, 1750 was phenomenal. Um, also, the cost of sunglasses. I already put in the order as soon as. 
I drove away because <laughs> I do have a pair that did get scratched on the boat trip from uh, a little bit of the battling going on on the boat. Uh, I'm a big fan of the hook gear anyways because uh, my wife continuously buys me their shirts, their pants, sweaters. And uh, this is like, I told her, hey, this is your get uh, get out of fr- uh, jail free card now. Let me go buy something for myself. Um, I got that. I got the Pro- uh, Daiwa Proteus rod. And then I got a Saltiga LD30. Um, not including the swag that came inside of the frog hog bags, some hooks, some fluorocarbon leader, and I believe a, a jig too that was in there too with some hooks. So, um, yeah, overwhelming. It was the, awesome. uh, that rod, that rod should be pretty perfect for the, the smaller grade bluefin. It was a, a 35, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, uh, should be a good. <clears throat> a good one for fishing, like 40, 50 pound even. I think that rod was kind of heavy. Yeah, it was. It was. I did uh, I did like the appeal of it. It was a very uh, pretty, good, uh, pretty good deal. Matter of fact, I tried to take it on with me on that El Dorado trip too, but I couldn't get the line. Just the, the timing of trying to get to a, to, to a tackle shop and getting to the Eldo was like, uh, I'm just going to hold off and see what's going on next, uh, for the next trip, so. Right on, Gonzo. Well, hey, you're going to be able to use it on your next one. Well, hopefully you don't have to use that one on your right. next trip, but bring it along with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You know, you'll be wanting to fish that big gear, and it sounds like if we keep this fishing up, it's going to just continue continue to progress, and we're going to see bigger and bigger Correct. fish each and every year during not just this tournament, but just every season has been just phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, this yeah. is unheard of. You know, my grandfather's a commercial tuna fisherman, and I just remember, you know, when you talk, they talk, all they ever talked about was albacore and anchovy. So now we're talking about uh, yummy flyers and plastic, uh, you know, baits and kite fishing now for bluefin. It's just completely do different, you know, eras. Yeah, right back to the Zane Gray days, yep. right? <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Well, we look forward to hearing from you soon and, and we'll talk to awesome, you later. Man. I appreciate your time. That's going to conclude episode 25 of the Western Outdoor News Podcast. Again, if you guys are looking for events, charters, or any upcoming tournaments, check out wonews.com. Thanks for listening.